Our power grid is fragile. We have continuous attacks, cyber attacks on it. CMP, EMP, lights out. Okay, we're not quite there yet, but yet is the key word. A NERC report warns of impending electrical shortages in North America this year. And NERC, it's the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. And if anybody knows about a power grid failure or power going out soon, it would be them. So it's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. And before that fateful day arrives, let's look at some of the things we can do to be ready. Number one, make a blackout bag. Not a bug out bag, a blackout bag. Or sometimes people use a box. Personally, I like a little backpack that the kids can carry with them. All of our kids have one and has all kinds of things in them in case the power goes out. And you'll see in a minute why that's so important. But it may have like these lanterns, which we have a lot of these. This one, the kids use too much. The batteries are almost dead, but you can still see how bright it is. I personally like my rechargeable flashlight so that way my solar generator can recharge it again instead of fishing for double A's. For the kids, every one of them have one of these squeeze lights. You ever seen these? They're really nice for the fact that they don't have to try to crank, even though we have crank lights too, but it's very easy for them to squeeze it. And when the time comes, it's super bright. So these work very well and we have all a whole bunch of these. One of the kids, every one of the kids has one of these. Now, with this, these bags are such a hit in our house because we have like games and activities in them. The kids always want to dig in them before the power goes out. And being here in the middle of nowhere, Michigan, we have the power go out often. And even then, they still want to get into these bags and play with them. But even more so, and this is so important, when the power goes out, for kids anyways, it can be very frightful. And having these drills, having their bags, let them play with the stuff in there, they actually get excited when the power goes out instead of getting scared when the power goes out. But it's more than just the kids for us too. Hopefully you have some kind of blackout bag or blackout box so when the power goes out, you can quickly get the flashlight to whatever you need to be able to you know, take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. Number two, have a crank radio, always handy. We have a bunch of them. This one by far is my favorite and I've shown it so many times on the channel. And I'll link it in the other stuff below, by the way, in case you wanna pick these up. This thing is great. Not only does it power by crank, but it powers by solar. And uh, actually you can put regular AA batteries in it too in case the, the rechargeable ones are dead for some reason. But it has radio, AM, FM. It has, uh, I think, shortwave. Yeah, shortwave, weather band, radio. All kinds of stuff on here. And we actually like to turn it on and just listen to radio stations even when the power is not out. It gives a nice, calm background music so you can listen to it. Or obviously, if there is an emergency, be able to keep up on stuff. So I definitely have a couple of these, at least one, obviously. So that way you can uh, keep in touch with the reality. Well, as much as you can with the reality with the news anyway, about things that are happening in the outside world. Number three, stockpiling food. And this video isn't about stockpiling foods, obviously. It's about power going out. So what foods do you want to stockpile for power outages? Cans of food that's already prepared, like meals in a can, for example. A can of chili, a can of beef stew, a can of SpaghettiOs. Well, maybe not so much SpaghettiOs, unless you absolutely love them, obviously. Chef Boyardee raviolios, that's where it's at. Okay, so have all those things available. Have a can opener, a manual can opener, can opener that is. You want to be able to get into the cans. And then you can do one of our favorite things too, is use some of the different smaller ingredients cans and put stuff together that's really easy to prepare food. Because you know when the power goes out, making dinner is more of a hassle, mind you. But when you actually have things that are prepared, like for example, and let me show you this real quick. This is our family cookbook that we've actually had for years. We've sold them for years. If you want to pick one of these up, by the way, in the description below, just click on the link to go to our website and you can get a digital edition or we can actually send one of these books to you. It's really inexpensive, but I will warn you, the menu in here is not keto. This is before we went keto, but there's a lot of like all time, old time generation family favorite um, foods in here that we've always used. In fact, we always just had like little cards and stuff, but since we made the book, that's actually what we do is we pull the book out and use it. But one of the ingredients in there and one of the recipes is snowball soup. And we call it this because you can see some of the things you put on there are simply some of the different types of beans, chili beans, maybe even cans of chili, Rotel tomatoes, corn, and water as desired. And down here, we talked about how our first year here, we were out of power for a couple of weeks. And this is before we really had a lot of things put in place, like you know a generator and such. And so we made this snowball soup, worked really well. You simply just take all the different types of beans and stuff, whatever you wanna put in it, put it into a pot, warm it up with whatever way you have. Our range, our gas stove still works when the power's out. And then of course we used snowballs to put in there to be able to add a little bit of water and make it more into soup. You don't even have to do that part by the way. But anyway, 
have meals that are very easy to prepare when the power is out because it's, it's such a hassle trying to make food when the power is out, you know, going by candlelight. Go for easy stuff. And, of course, if you want to pick up our cookbook, it's available in the description down below. And number four, have plenty of water. And this is so true. A gallon per person per day is what everybody says. But I find a lot of those people, those everybody's, has never really gone long term without power. A gallon per person per day is like bare bones minimum. I would recommend more like two gallons per person per day because you need it for so many things. And having water obviously is vital for life. What I recommend, by the way, I mean, we do a couple things for storing water in our house. We have those giant fruit punch that's really bad for you, those gallon jugs. They're big anyway. And whenever we have like a birthday party or something, we'll take those and wash them out. And they work very well for storing water. Put a little bit of bleach in there. But even beyond that, you could actually just get a 55-gallon drum. 55-gallon drums are amazing, and I'm going to link below, and not just a 55-gallon drum, but a 55-gallon drum kit that actually has a pump and everything for it. And what I would say is this. If you're going to be storing water, probably a 55-gallon drum per person per month. Even though we're looking at one gallon per day, that's not quite enough. 55 gallons, that's actually pretty close to being realistic as far as having enough water per person per month. So pick up one of those or find some kind of means for storing water because those like little milk cartons and stuff won't work. They'll break open. You'll have water everywhere. Number five, fridge and freezer concerns. Power goes out, your fridge, you're starting to see about four hours before the food starts getting too warm. That's really bad. Depending on the freezer, 24 or 48 hours. If it's a chest freezer, it works much more, much more efficiently. And especially if we're talking about more in the long term, we'll talk about long term in a minute. You want to have a way to build at least, even if you don't have refrigeration, at least maintain your freezer. And we have a Blue Eddy, the AC200 Max. This thing's fantastic with the solar panels. And I've tested it out and it works. I can literally keep our chest freezer going indefinitely just by using solar, even if it's a cloudy day. And because when you come to a chest freezer, they're very efficient, by the way. And secondly, the compressor doesn't go on all the time like a fridge will. Even a fridge doesn't go all the time, but it's very common, especially as you open and close the door. But every time you open the door, that coldness pours out of the fridge. With the chest freezer, it basically holds inside of it, works very well. So I would recommend if you don't have some kind of chest freezer, and you can afford it, get a chest freezer and get maybe like the Blue Eddy AC200 Max. Again, I'll link that specific solar generator down below. So you can actually have freezer practically indefinitely. Now, I have people say all the time, we went thousands of years without having power. I don't need to have a solar generator. That's true. But our modern mankind has not gone thousands of years without power. We're simply not used to it. So generators work well, number six. And they're fantastic. We have a few different types of generators. We have a smaller generator for just powering stuff. We have a whole house generator, not like the big Generax. Those are sweet, by the way. But we have a 10,000 watt generator, just a gas generator that I can literally plug into my home. I installed one of those big outlets so I can plug it in and shut off the main breaker and it's bypassed. So that way, I, you don't want to have your generator and your power going in at the same time. That's called your house burning down. But ours is set up so we can actually power the entire house with our generator too, our gas generator, and it works very well. But the problem is, you have to ask yourself this, how long is the power going to be out? How much gas do you have? I have a friend in California who has a propane generator and he has a massive propane tank. I mean, massive. And he literally can power his home for a good year or two on his generator. I mean, we do have to worry about as far as, you know, people hearing your generator, that's always a possibility too. And, but having some kind of power is good, even if it's a solar generator, if you possibly can, even if it's not a matter of pushing heat with a fan in your house, I don't know about you, but during the summer, I really like to sleep with a fan on. That's worth its weight in gold right there. Number seven, obviously you'll need a heat source too. A fireplace is great. A wood stove or even a pellet stove is ideal. A pellet stove, if we talk about crap hits the fan, where are you going to get the pellets from? But a wood stove, you know, you can hopefully find wood or broken up furniture that you can keep your house with. That's what they did back in days. And when things fell apart, they would actually start using their furniture as their heat source. Um, like our house, I mentioned, our gas range will still work. You know, our oven won't, but the range will have to manually light it. But the gas range will continuously cook food for us and put a little bit of heat in the house too. You do have to worry about open flames. And even with a buddy heater, which I recommend, or we have one of those big metal cage looking kerosene heaters, which I highly recommend. We use those for years and still have ours and love it. Anytime you have an open flame, anytime you have an open flame, I don't care if it's your gas range or a buddy heater or even a candle, it puts off carbon monoxide which obviously is deadly. 
with this. Obviously, a candle is not going to put enough carbon monoxide to cause problems. Buddy heaters and kerosene heaters are made to not put off certain amounts. Your gas range will put off a little bit more depending on how much you use it. So you do have to be concerned about that. So if you are going to heat your home with any type of open flame or any type of flame heat source, obviously a kerosene burner is not open flame, but there's a flame in there, I would have a battery-powered carbon monoxide detector. In our house, we have a bunch of carbon monoxide detectors that plug in. They don't have to keep replacing batteries. But getting a sole battery-powered one is fantastic because, of course, if the power's out, you don't have to try to find some kind of power source for it. In addition, a fire extinguisher. Always have those on hand. That's always just a good safety rule anyway. Be able to want to be able to heat your house without catching your house on fire. And number eight, entertainment. And it's simple math. No power plus no lights equals insanity. Insanity for your kids, mind you, because, I mean, if your kids do like a little bit of TV or screen time, that's going to be limited or disappear. At first, it's fun when the lights go out. It's kind of like a big game for them. But after a while, they'll be like, Mom, Dad, I'm bored. And, of course, you're trying to deal with trying to make food and everything with the power outage. It's difficult. Having some means of entertainment for you and your children is important. That's why I talk about having this. So you can at least listen to the radio. You can listen to the news. But obviously, have board games cards for the kids, even puzzles, crayons, anything they might enjoy to be able to do things without the power being on. Entertainment is often overlooked because people don't think, well, I'm not going to, it's not going to save my life, but it kind of will because you'll go bat crazy without having some kind of entertainment coming in or at least news of what's going on in the outside world. Okay. Now when it comes to power outages, so far we've talked about short term, we have to address long term. If we're looking at like an EMP, or a coronal mass ejection from the sun, it could be very real and very serious and may knock our power out literally for years. And before we jump into what you need to do about that, hit that like button, you know, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done so. And let's keep going. Number nine, long-term heat. Long-term, no gas, no propane. You may not even have the wood for a wood stove or your pellet stove. So you need to find ways to keep warm. Sleeping bags are good. Cold weather sleeping bags are good. But layers are so important. Even if you just have like, like we have so many sleeping bags and they're not cold weather sleeping bags at all, but you do nice and layers on top and below. It actually works very well in keeping you warm. And we also have some tents, not only for our backpacking and bugging out, whatever, but we have tents we can put up in our house and it will uh, increase the warmth, the body heat, everybody in there. You do have to look at a little bit of moisture inside there, but the moisture inside the whole room will increase anyway because people breathing and such. Something else you can do is if you have one room that you want to coordinate it off, maybe it's your master bedroom, don't even just shut the door. But if you can take some blankets and tack them up so they cover the doors and the windows and such, it'll help maintain that heat. Again, it'll be dark, it'll be dreary, and you want to go nuts, but at least you'll be staying warm. And that's something that's going to be getting you through these troubled times. Number 10, now also water. No power for long term means no water to your house. And everybody always says, quickly fill up your tub, which I do recommend. Fill up any jug you might have, that's great. Emergency situations, there's water possibly in the back of your toilet or your hot water heater has water. And that's true, all of that's so true. But even then, it's only gonna last so long. You have to have a way to be able to get water coming to your home. And for most people, that's probably gonna be some kind of rainwater catchment or snow catchment where you bring the water in. And by the way, rain coming from the air, there's a lot of pollutants in the air, maybe washing it down. Don't think that water is going to be clean and pure. But even with that, if you have a nearby stream, it's not going to be water you can drink straight out. So you're going to need some kind of filter. People like Berkey's and such, and that's fine. It is an activated charcoal filter. It is kind of slow drip. And using gravity-fed filters do work well. For us, we have these Katadynes. They are a little bit on the pricey side, but this guy, man, I mean, it's like durable metal. These things are amazing. This will literally turn a mud puddle, and I mean thick mud puddle, into fresh drinking water, and it'll do thousands of gallons. So again, I'll link these below, but just make sure you have some kind of good activated charcoal filter to filter out your rainwater, stream water, whatever the case may be. Number 11, power. And again, people say all the time that, oh, mankind's been without power for thousands of years. That's true, but have you been without power for a long time? This is a valid question, by the way, because it's not simply just living a life of luxury. There are certain things like refrigeration alone or having a freezer actually increases life expectancy. And if you don't believe me, look at the stats for like third world countries where they don't have refrigeration or freezing. They do have ways to keep things cool, but your freezer can keep things basically fresh per se for years. You know, we have ways to preserve food that way. 
I mean, obviously we have other ways to preserve food. That's true. But it takes a lot of time and energy to do that. Having power is such a huge thing. Now, again, in the middle of nowhere, we were forced into a situation when we moved here in our first winter here, which we got layered and layered with snow, so much snow. We lost power for a couple weeks on end. And we quickly had to learn and adapt to know what it's like into a life without water. With that, we could still drive to town if we wanted to. I mean, actually, we were snowed in, but you could still go to town and we had snow out here. But now, well, we have generators and other stuff to be able to accommodate. What about you? What do you have in play to be able to, in case the power goes out? Because having that power out and you're not used to it, that's the key. Mankind may have gone thousands of years without power, but you may not have. Your best bet is go to your main breaker and say, hey, guys, shut it off. Here we're going to go. We're going to go three days without power. And let's go ahead and put all this stuff into action. Because I'll tell you, the first few days of doing that, if you've never done that before, can be very troubling and chaotic. And if you don't practice ahead of time and the real thing does happen, it is going to be even more dismal than normal. And finally, number 12, the worst case scenario. So what can be worse than that? People. I love people. I saw a bumper sticker the other day. I was a people person until I actually started hanging out with people. And I get that. I still am a people person. But understand that in a situation where the power grid goes down, you're going to have hungry, which means desperate, which means violent people. History has proven this. People will start coming to your house. They won't be knocking on your door. They won't be pounding on the do your door. They will be trying to break down your door, trying to keep their family fed. And even though you may actually have prepped and you have a month's worth of food, that father from down the street who has kids too and has used up his food two days ago, he's going to, even if he's the nicest guy in the world and help you trim your hedges, he's going to be coming over and saying, why do you have food and I don't? I mean, granted, because he spent all his money going to like the movies and other stuff, whereas you were smart and you prepped stuff ahead, but nevertheless, they're going to become violent. You need to understand that if we look at a full power grid failure, it's estimated 90% of the population is going to die. And it's not from lack of food. It's from violence, from fires, from all this chaos that's going to envelop from this. If you don't believe me, look in the 1970s in New York City, the power went out just for 25 hours. 25 hours, just barely a day, just over a day. And what are we having? What do we have? 1,600 looting, over 1,000 fires set, chaos. And that was just 24 hours. Could you imagine if the power went out for much longer than that? And look at this last article, shutdown of power grid likely, says writer. And this writer says right here, disasters are coming. A worker at FEMA said they expect the grid to go down in the next six months, and it'll be down for 37 days, 37 days. And when New York was out of power, all these problems happened. It was just one day. So you need to prepare for this because only a few days of hunger, desperation will ensue. And you have to be ready, not for necessarily having food and heat and everything. That's true too, but for the people. If we're looking at like a CME, a coronal mass ejection, an EMP, certain cyber attacks, the power could go down for years, not even just 30 days, seven days, but for years. Are you ready for that?